language. Today in this film, we're going to take a little look at the use of a handgun and also firearms in general for protection against wildlife in the bush. And right now, we're in the Canadian bush. Some of you might be thinking, hey, there's something wrong here. You can't carry a handgun in Canada. right I guess but there are circumstances in Canada where you can carry a handgun. Uh, you, in most cases it's for people who are uh, licensed trappers on a registered fur management area which is what we have and so you have to go through a lot of steps to get an authorization to carry. One of those steps is taking a proof of proficiency exam. Now, Proficiency exam is really geared towards ensuring that if you're going to carry a handgun in the bush that you actually could do something with it to save your life if it was an animal attack. Now let's just start off by saying the risk of getting attacked by a bear or a cougar or some other wild animal in the bush is it's very very slight and it's very hard to get someone who's an expert on that because it doesn't happen to many people and I'm not one of them either. But having said that, if you are going to carry a handgun or a rifle in the bush too, it applies the same way for protection. You should put a little bit of thought into what kind of techniques you should employ, what kind of firearm you should use, all those things. Put a little thought into it. And this uh, becomes evident with the proof of proficiency exam. Where that exam, one of the steps, and I'm not going to demonstrate drawing the gun out of the holster because that's actually in violation of the authorization to carry conditions. You can only use it to actually protect yourself. But one of the, the tests that you have to go through, it's rapid fire with preferably something like a 44 Magnum, something that's capable of putting a big animal down. And you have to draw it and you fire six shots hitting a target 50 feet away, all within the required target area in a space of 20 seconds from start to finish. One of those steps is doing it in a standing position, but they also include a kneeling position. So you take the gun out and you're like that, shooting from a kneeling position. Now I've heard that some people kind of scratch their heads at that kneeling position because, you know, who shoots from a kneeling position? Well, I'll tell you something. This is where, where this type of use of a firearm, and handgun in particular in this case, really differs from what you see about self-defense and use of firearms to protect yourself on the internet in general. Most of that stuff is geared towards attacking yourself from human two-legged predators that are coming at you. But if we're talking about an attacking bear, like a grizzly, that bear is only about that high or a black bear, or a cougar, or something like that. It's about that high, and the distance it can travel is remarkably fast. Like, it can cover a distance of 50 feet in one second. So I'm gonna show you some videos with diagrams to illustrate the point, but basically the purpose of shooting from a kneeling position is because you are shooting at a, an animal that's not this high, but down here, and it's moving towards you at a very high rate of speed, really fast, faster than a racehorse actually. So if you are shooting from an elevated position, you're going to shoot over the back of that animal because you pull the trigger and by the time you've done that, the animal is closer to you and you've shot over its back. But if you are shooting straight on down the pipe at them, you're far more likely to hit that fast approaching animal. So. That is one of the things we're going to cover in this video. Try to explain that and we'll go into some other aspects of defensive shooting too. I mean, we're not going to leave out the, the standing position. There are requirements for that too. Again, 
differing from what you'll usually see on the internet. This is using a high powered handgun, a 44 Magnum, something that has substantial recoil. So a gun like that is going to rock you back. And if you have to take more than two or three shots and you're shooting your gun like this, you're going to be like this and having to regain your position, footing position, in order to take some additional shots. So you got to start off leaning right into the gun, have your feet really planted into the ground and go. So I hope you like this video and if you appreciate the content give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because this kind of content you're not going to find everywhere on the internet. So let's get into this and take a look at how a standing position can end up being far worse than a kneeling position when you're shooting at a fast approaching animal. Okay, since the angles are going to be important, I've drawn this grid here to be to scale for a standing position grid and a kneeling position. So I think the first thing we need is we need to have ourselves a shooter. So let's put one up here on the standing position. And let's get a shooter depicting the kneeling position on the graph below. So now we have these two shooters and we need ourselves a couple of bears, right? So let's put a bear in the standing position over at the 50 foot mark. We'll get another one here over on the kneeling position at the 50 foot mark. Now, hopefully if you are ever in a position where you need to defend yourself from a bear attack, I really hope you have more than 50 feet warning and that you've seen the bear coming a little further away than that because a, a grizzly bear can run at 35 miles per hour and that means covering a distance like the one we see here in one second. So that means having to take your gun out of the holster and aim and shoot in one second which is mighty mighty challenging. So let's just hope you have more than 50 feet before you see that bear. But uh, so, but let's suppose that uh, you may be shooting, having your gun drawn and ready to shoot when the bear is at the 50 foot mark. This is all just very hypothetical, but we gotta go with something, right? Now the purpose of this demonstration is gonna be to show the difference in angles as the bear approaches. Now let's start with a standing position here. And let's let that bear go to 30 feet. Okay, we'll just hold that there. Now when we look at that bear at 30 feet, take a look at those two angles. We were aiming, let's say, at him when he was 50 feet away, and now he's 30 feet away, you could be shooting over the back of that animal because the angle has changed. You're, it's, it's a different type of leading for a shot than you normally do when an animal's running to left to right. This is not what people are used to at all. So in reality, if you were standing, you'd want to aim a little bit low because it takes a little bit of time for your reactions to pull the trigger and the bullet to leave the gun and for the bullet to actually travel that distance and hit the animal. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves that this animal's moving very fast. So this uh, distance from 50 feet to 30 feet, that's a third of a second, right? Now let's let the animal close the distance from 30 feet to 10 feet. Okay, we'll hold it there then. Now we see we have quite a large difference in angle. Of course, my little figure of the standing person shooting is still pointing way above the bear's back, but you get the idea. So he would have to be shooting quite a bit further down at the 10 foot mark. So maybe he's pulling the trigger at the 30 foot mark and uh, your angle is just increasing more rapidly the closer the animal gets. Of course the animal's getting bigger too, it's becoming a bigger target, but this is why a shooter will tend to shoot over the back of an animal because it's not high off the ground like a human being, let's say, would be running towards you. It's low and then that angle is changing. So uh, it's hopefully that illustrates the nature of the problem. 
Now, without beating this horse to death too much, let's just take a quick look at how that all would appear to the shooter from a kneeling position. I'm going to let that animal just run all the way. Let's let him run all the way to the shooter and you can see as the animal is closing the distance to the kneeling shooter, the angle doesn't change or at least if it does it's pretty well inconsequential. So that's the main point of this video is to give you a sense of that changing angle that's involved when you're a uh, standing shooter. And this applies whether you're shooting a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun. So I think experienced guides and shooters will tell you this, that if you can take that shot kneeling or be low to the ground. Well, I think that pretty much covers our topic on the subject of protecting yourself from wild animal attack using a rifle, shotgun, or a handgun. I could add a, one or two things here. Uh, since you're here anyways, I see a lot of people buying these pistol grip shotguns and uh, a lot of the motivation behind that is they want to have something along that's able to fit on their ATV and that type of thing. That isn't uh, going to get caught in the bush or not be too heavy. Uh, maybe they're fishing or maybe they're not actually hunting and they want a, a gun to take along with them. That's all fine to have these very short club handle or pistol grip shotguns. But on the topic that we're covering here, pertinent to that, is the speed at which you can get that firearm up and aimed on an animal. And from what I've seen and in my own experience, if you have a rifle or a shotgun that has a full stop on it that you can get to your shoulder quickly, you're going to be able to line up a shot much quicker than you will with something that's kind of flopping around, you know, holding a pistol grip here. And that, that would apply also to uh, a Rossi branch hand or a mare's leg, one of those com very compact lever action rifles. So just a, just a caution on that note. You might also wonder a little bit about my choice of firearm. Uh, it's, a, it's an awful long barrel on this thing, isn't it? I could have gone with with a more compact Security 6 and 357 Magnum, but I like this gun. Some people say that you know I should get a shorter barreled handgun, but really uh, for my purposes, it's not worth it to buy a different handgun. This one, I really like it. It's actually designed for handgun metallic silhouette shooting that I was engaged in a lot in the 80s. And so now I still have this this very fine 44 Magnum Model 29. Also a consideration in the Canadian context is that you have to pass a shooting test that's out to 50 feet and with pretty good accuracy with rapid fire. So a little snubby nose handgun like this is going to be a little more challenging than it is with this gun here. Some of you might have noticed that holster that I'm wearing at the beginning of this video. I'll just mention that I do have plans available for that if you're interested. It's a very good holster. I designed it myself. Some of the rationale behind it is having two speed loaders on the holster. Those I've made myself also. I'm kind of a a cheap guy, you know, so I tend to make everything myself. The holster plans, I can provide that for you. I have it in PDF format. I also have videos which I'm going to peg on the top corner of this video so that you can access them on how to make your own stuff out of leather. Yeah, that's pretty much the extent of it here. I thought I'd just cover a few of those final points. Wade and Native Chronicles is an ongoing enterprise here and if you got something out of this video, I'd appreciate it if you click subscribe if you haven't already. Click like. There's a bell icon as well for notifying you when new videos come out. So for the Way to Native Chronicles, until next time, God bless.